Hi, welcome to Eflux. It's it's a real pleasure tonight to to introduce the second the second night of two um, two nights of discussions with artists, where Maria Linz has chosen two artists each night to talk about art. <laughs> and this takes for granted the discussions about art, right? It takes for granted that something seems to have happened in the discourse of art or in the approach to making art by artists where structural conditions, either due to austerity measures, due to changes in the economy, where concerns of artists and concerns of people who look at art have shifted from something which maybe retrospectively we can think of as aesthetics or something that maybe we can retroactively think of as being more soulful or more engaged, has switched to something which is more infrastructural and which is more about survival. And something has happened in discussions about art or in the approach to making art where something has maybe gone missing, right? And what is it that has gone missing? So maybe I think in the choice of in the choice of artists here, maybe there is something to be to be learned about how something can be rescued from that. So last night the discussions were with Doug Ashford and with Mary Walling Blackburn, and tonight the guests are Emily Segel from Cahill and Naim Mohaim. Um, I won't drone on too long and let Maria introduce our speakers. Thanks for coming. And I think also if, if it gets really crowded, there will be more seating here and you can sit in the front, although everyone has seats now. So. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you, Eflux, for making this possible. Um, it's an opportunity, I think, to stop for a moment and uh, think about what we're doing. And for me, as a curator and as the director of an art space in a suburb of Stockholm, where a lot of time goes into, precisely as Brian said, thinking about and working towards survival, making the structure just function. Um, we can now, together for a moment, actually focus on a couple of different artworks. And uh, this has uh, come out of, of um, discussions that Brian and I have had over a couple of years. And they will also continue in the EFLUX conversations online. So we can consider these two evenings as, as the kickoff for something uh, that will have a further life. I think it's particularly uh, great to be able to do this at EFLUX as an artist-initiated and artist-led organization. And um, although I don't live here, I follow the activities from afar, and it's often inspirational. Um, but it's also... Uh, quite clear that um, artworks themselves do not uh, appear very often in situations like this one. So in the spirit of informality rather than formality, we will uh, look at, think about, talk about two uh, separate artworks. The invitation was for Emily and Naim to select an artwork. It could be by yourselves or by somebody else. And uh, we will do these brief presentations, uh, 10 to 15 minutes each. Then we will enter into a conversation. And there will also be uh, a chance for you to enter this conversation towards the end. So Naeem, you're the one to start. On. Is this working? Hi, good afternoon slash evening, everyone. Thank you, Maria, for the invitation and Eflux for hosting us. Uh, let's see if I can get this going. Um, so I am actually going to talk about a film I'm editing right now, um, which will finish and screen next month. Um, but I'm going to talk about two other related works. Um, and show clips from the other one in order to talk about the current one. Um, this is the film I'm not going to show clips from. 
It's um, Godai and Ziga Vertov group, or Godai is part of Ziga Vertov group's film here and elsewhere. I had originally thought to show it, and then when I watched it again this week, after a long gap, decided that I didn't want to show it as the work, and hopefully we'll talk about why even the way I think of this film has changed um, since the first time I saw it. Um, but this film, just for those who may not have seen it, um, very important for a very particular reason. Um, the original film was called Victory. Um, most people haven't seen the original, but it was probably a fairly straightforward work of propaganda. Uh, and then when Goda and the group went back um, to the situation, it turned out that many of the people that they heroically filmed on screen um, died or were killed in one of the major first sort of major uh, defeats or pushbacks for the PLO's um, position. And it was a dramatic shift of image versus reality. And so the film he then goes and makes with the rest of the group looks at that discrepancy between the images they had filmed um, and the reality without having access to new images of what had happened. Um, and there's a way that when I first saw the film, there was a certain sort of um, lack of cynicism that I ascribed to it. And then there's a way that when I saw it again this week, I saw it differently. And Maria and I might disagree on this as well, which I've chosen not to show it. Um, so what the clip I'm going to show and then talk about the film I'm working on right now is part of a series that I've been doing since 2006, which is called The Young Man Was. Um, and it's a look at uh, the revolutionary left uh, in the 1970s, but through specific episodes that happened in the history of Bangladesh, and then connected to certain um, global moments. So I'm going to show the clip and then talk about the project, if I can see. Oh, so just to set up the clip, because it's going to be literally in the dark. Um, it's a 70-minute film, which is about the hijack of Japan Airlines uh, 472 in 1977. It was hijacked to Bangladesh by the Japanese Red Army. Uh, and it was in Dhaka for five days. And then that was the beginning of a whole series of related incidents. Um, but the film mostly operates in darkness. It's uh, the negotiation between the hijacker, the lead hijacker of the Japanese Red Army, and the Air Force chief in Bangladesh. And the color uh, scheme here um, is one color is the Japanese um, lead hijacker, and the other color is the Air Force chief. And it's a 70-minute film, and a lot of it is very tense. But this is a moment when things shift. And I'll talk about the shift uh, once I show the clip. I hope this works. I have only one information that the Japanese government has requested for a special flight from Tokyo to Dhaka. I am trying to do things so that negotiator. time is short as possible. So please remember we are doing everything to things to happen as early as possible. Alright. Thank you. I will call you back if there is anything further, okay? All right. And uh, please arrange uh, sending the first group of captures, newspapers, and uh, empty group camera. Over. Now about the newspaper, about the newspaper, whether I will be able to get the permission to give you the newspaper or not. Because newspapers always tell lies. Most of the time, they are not correct. We like to get uh, correct information from you. We want, uh, we ask the newspaper because we like to know the of our Danke, I will collect two, three newspapers and read out the news items to you. I agree. And uh, if, if uh, you can, uh, please send out the uh, alcohol. Alcohol. 
After this, actually, it goes into a scene of Walter Cronkite, uh, and then you discover that their main hostage that they're holding as their key person they're going to kill um, is misidentified as Jewish American, but he's actually Armenian, and that's the sum of the news report. Um, and then it goes on from there. Um, why I wanted to show that clip um, in particular and sort of think through uh, s certain ways of thinking about, writing about, and making work about the revolutionary left of the 1970s that I feel for me, uh, when I saw the film again, the film didn't work in the same way. Um, you know, there's a great deal of humor in this film, um, accidental and otherwise. You know, they're watching the television screen and this man is unemployed. There's other sub-stories going on. And what I saw as a sort of very generative move when I first saw it, now I was wondering, so is this laughing with or laughing at uh, this movement? Because both can happen. And I think over the last seven, eight years, I've shifted to a place where uh, laughing at, in some ways, was more comfortable for me. And now it's not. Um, so in, in the hijack film, that moment of mistranslation is the moment when the film flips. Because up to then, it's very um, austere and sincere and earnest and, you know, you're worried, and if you're off the left, then you're looking at this and thinking, oh, this is yet another left disaster. This is going to end terribly. Um, and that moment allows you or allowed me the freedom to laugh in that moment. Um, and then as I kept making more films in the series, even that uh, emotion of laughter became complicated for me. And it's one of the things I'm working through with the next film. Um, uh, so, just, uh, so this is a still from United Red Army, which was the first film in the series. Uh, and the series is also about a certain kind of doomed and performative masculinity that's embedded within these movements. And so in this one, the protagonist is the Air Force chief uh, and the um, lead hijacker, who we've learned recently actually has passed away. Uh, in part two, which is Afsan's long day, uh, the protagonist is a Bangladeshi historian who um, actually gets arrested in a case of mistaken identity. They think he's a Maoist organizer. Um, he's not. He's just a journalist who likes to be in discussion circles, Marxist study circles. And the big moment in that film is when they find uh, copies of translations of Karl Marx with Karl Marx's face on the cover, and they think it's him. And there's a sequence in his diary where he says, um, he says, so some people were alive that day that thought Karl Marx uh, wrote books in Bengali uh, with his photograph on the cover. Um, so there's many other things in the film, but that's the second film. Still, I had some space um, for humor, but in this case, the humor didn't make me uncomfortable because it's in his words. Um, those were from his diary, so I felt, okay, it's his um, own distancing from the moment. Um, and I've talked to him about it, and he says that, oh, the only way I can deal with that particular moment is to laugh at how absurd many things were. Uh, and then he also understands that engaging with me, I don't have the same feeling because I didn't go through the same arc of disappointment. Having, been, um, having grown up after that moment. Um, and then the film that I'm working on right now, which is the third in the series called Last Man in Dhaka Central, um, which is what I want to talk about briefly um, related to what I just said, um, is a different complicated space because this is um, Peter Custers. He's a Dutch journalist and academic. He dropped out of his PhD program in 1974 uh, to go to Bangladesh and, as we know unofficially, to get involved with the movement. Um, officially, later on, he had to say he was there as a journalist, and that's part of the story. Um, when Bangladesh in 1975 went through a series of uh, military coups and Maoist uprisings, 
And basically, it's high moment of leftist insurgencies that were collapsed. Um, he was one of the people arrested uh, and charged with being a conspirator. But he was the only one who was released after a year because he was European and there was a, a Dutch campaign um, for his release. And one of the things um, I've been struggling with while making this film, first of all, he's much more engaged with the topic than anybody else I've worked with before. So he doesn't have this approach of, you can make what you want. I've left that movement behind or that moment behind. He's still inhabiting that moment. So there's, um, I mean, I've, I've been used to these situations, not necessarily by design, where I've gone in and I've interviewed people. And then while I'm working on the film, if I'm telling them what I'm doing, you know, they're not so invested necessarily in the final form because there's a way they've left that moment behind. And they're talking to me sort of because I'm interested, but not necessarily for their own interest. With Peter, he's very invested in this moment, even today. He still writes. He is very, you know, he's very conscious. He's asked me where the film is showing. He's asked me what sort of audience. And then there's a description problem because it's not a film festival audience. And then you talk about the idea of a loop and people being able to walk in and out at any time. And he's very concerned, as he should be, about what if people walk in in the middle and don't watch it all the way through, what happens. So um, as a result of working with him, um, this was a situation where, um, I mean, perhaps there was no humor that uh, the situation evolved. The film, as it worked, there were no accidental humor moments. Um, so it's, it's fairly austere um, and long in its structure. But I also started wondering recently, um, also in conversation uh, with friends, about how much he um, is a different kind of protagonist who's pulling me into his orbit much more than I'm uh, pulling him into his. So that's one of the things I wanted to just throw out as a, a possible um, discussion point. Um, the other thing is that um, he's very, um, he's very, um, he's very clear in all his formulation. Um, if I use the word Maoist somewhere, on screen, he will tell me that actually the movement was X hyphen X. He's very precise. And he'll tell me why that matters. And I'm used to people having left those arguments behind. He hasn't. For him, it's actually of vital interest in 2015, um, even now. So and then it's been an interesting navigation. And one of the ways that I um, cut through it, um, or try to cut through it in this scene, um, the text actually is from a very sentimental pop love song that doesn't have anything to do with this time, actually. It's from much later. It's from my time of being in high school. Uh, and I use the song um, in the opening. And so the song is, um, the song can be read, however, but it, it was alien to him. Um, it was unrecognizable. And he said at one point, um, if you wanted to represent my time, this is not the song I would have chosen. Um, why did you choose this song? It was a. Uh, um, there's a moment of dissonance for him as well. And then I thought, what does that mean for me? Um, so I just, I don't have an answer uh, to this problem. But I thought about that also. Of, I mean, I'm, I've become aware of, in some ways, the ease of humor to talk about movements that matter a lot to you as a way to cut through my own discomfort at the failure of the movement. And then I've articulated humor as also a way of love for that movement, because only if you love it can you express that. And then he um, puts me face to face with somebody, um, a, a situation where he did live through the movement, and he's not, uh, doesn't have the same comfort with um, not taking every moment very seriously. And of course, I respect that um, a lot, but it's been an interesting, uh, strange navigation. This is, a, um, this is from the newsreel footage when he was first released um, in 76. And then I wanted to um, sort of pause and end um, around here. Um, so one of the things he wanted me to do is um, he wanted to give the interviews in Bengali. Um, because he speaks Bengali, he learned it as part of his political uh, activism in 1974-75. But I felt he was much more articulate in English. There's a different kind of conversation I wanted to have. And so that was a disappointment for him, that I didn't interview him in Bengali, but I asked for all the interviews to be in English. That was already a 
disconnect between us and a dialogue in which I prevailed at least in that part. So then he really wanted me to um, record him uh, reading this poem, which is by one of his comrades who was also jailed with him and was also released and who's now in exile um, in Europe, I think in Norway. So he had written a poem which he read and we filmed and then we ended up using it because it worked for various things. But then when I look at that poem, I feel that the poem is, uh, it's very, um, uh, it's very, very um, minimalist um, social revolution pain structure of a particular kind. Uh, and there's this moment in there where it translates to never met, never even tasted pleasure. It's talking about poverty. Um, and I thought about this and I thought of a certain withholding of pleasure that was um, that that was in that may have been in this movement, uh, what I understand to be the revolutionary left, at least in South Asia, and that is still there now. And it's a um, it's a point of separation between myself and him, for example, in the sense that I want to interject humor or interject a little bit of uh, possibility of slippage in how we talk about the movement. I want to use, for example, the word Maoist, but he wants that very specific formulation which would stretch across the screen and not work um, visually. You know, I mean, these are small matters, but these also reveal a sort of um, a relaxed position that I'm taking, which he can't share. And I actually very much respect his uh, non-relaxed position, but then I also think what it does in terms of my position. Uh, and then I started thinking about um, what it means to look back at these moments from a moment that's, that, that doesn't have that possibility, and then what it does to our forms of work. Um, so I don't have a conclusion, but I have a whole series of questions. Um, and I suppose I'll end by saying that in some ways the other films I made and the people I work with, they're all alive and healthy. Um, but I feel that there was a way that they had placed themselves out of that time. And their awakening of memory is only at my presence. And Peter confounded me because he has so much agency that it squeezes out my ability to um, guide the story. And I feel that when I go back to the Godot film, one of the reasons that it made me uncomfortable not looking back is I think certain gestures were possible precisely because many of the people that they film were dead, so you could speak on their behalf. And now I've started to wonder if some of the other works I've done, I've been able to speak on people's behalf. They're still alive, but they're not engaged in the same way. And I'm thinking through what it means that this man is engaged, what it says about his position. So I will stop there. Great, thing. thank you. Can you maybe say something more about um, the structure of the film and the kind of footage that you're using? of Last Man in Dhaka Central, uh, yeah. this new one. What, what um, does the film actually consist of? It's, uh, the, it's, it's almost entirely his interviews now, um, but you don't see much of him. You mostly see a lot. This is one of the scenes where you see him, but most of the time you see his house. Um, and each of the chapters ends with a archival footage from the time of his release. And the sequence is reversed, so when the film first starts out, you already know that he's been in jail for a year and that Henry Kissinger is involved from the American side to downplay reports of his torture. That's the beginning. And then you know he's been released, and then you go backwards by the time you get to the end. So he's speaking in the now, going through it chronologically, but the archive already tells you that what's going to happen. So it goes against him. Um, and the archive also has this juxtaposition because there's a way that he produced himself when he first got out of jail and the way he produces himself now. And I don't point to it, but it's there for people to tease out. And it's 80 eight minutes long. So. How, how long? 88 minutes. So we'll see. And you're now finishing it for Venice? Yeah. For the biennial. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Naeem. Is this, is this thing on? I'm Emily, thanks for having me. I'm about to show you a very, very different type of project. Um, I'm going to talk for a second first. So I'm Emily, I'm one of the five founding members, or five members and founding members of K-Hole, which is an art collective that 
and con now business that produces trend forecasting reports. We started in 2010 when we had all just finished school and moved to New York. We were all working in various like commercial capacities to pay the rent and also had our various artistic practices going on at the same time. And we were looking around and noticing that many of our peers were in a similar situation. They were acting as if there was like a total separation of church and state in that situation where it's like, I write Marxist theory by night and by day I do graphic design for Martha Stewart and never the twain shall meet. And for us, there was like a great degree of fluidity between our lives as workers and like doing specifically like marketing and design and that type of thing and being artists and writers and poets. And we were actually like noticing a lot of similarities between the logic of contemporary art and the logic of marketing and branding. And we thought, why not take this like nasty nausea that we have about this thing and turn it into art? So one of the cool things about this particular conversation, the way it's being framed, is that a lot of the things that I do as an artist are in contexts that are not usually considered art, which is obviously a classic artist thing to do. But in this case, it's like, in this case, it's like I view my work which is like both in the art world as part of K-Hole, but also as a brand consultant and now as a creative director of a tech startup as my art practice. And in part, I use K-Hole as an active art practice, but I also use it as a sort of like alibi or like reason to frame stuff that I'm doing in a commercial capacity as art. So in the context of this conversation, which is like, what is the art part, basically? Like, good question. Like, I don't know, but I'm definitely standing up for it in a certain way where I'm, when I'm saying like, no, the thing that I'm doing isn't just like a commercially motivated thing, it's art. So like, what am I saying then? That's like something that maybe we can figure out when we sit back down on the red couch. So I'm gonna show you a project that I did that is something that I did independently from K-Hole, but for me there's like a great d degree of fluidity between all the things. It's like, K-Hole's the band, I do my like solo album, we like jam together, or whatever. So this is like a solo K-Hole Emily thing, but it's related to a lot of the things that K-Hole does. Um, and I think it's in here. So this is a TEDx talk that I gave. Oh, okay, hold on. Are you looking at this? Uh-oh, I'm having a screen issue. Can somebody... Also, a really classic presentation mood to be like, I can't use the thing. Okay, um, basically this is a TEDx talk that I gave in Liechtenstein. So the, this is also like an, so basically a friend of, a really good friend of mine who's a really good artist, Simon Denny, um, did, a, created a real TEDx conference in the art museum in Liechtenstein. Um, so it was, when you do a TEDx conference, you like apply for a license to do your own TED conference from Big TED and they say, yes, you can do this real TED conference. So this wasn't like an artist's performance of a TEDx conference, this was a real TEDx conference. But it was done in this like ambiguous artist context where it was in this weird art museum in Vaduz, like never going back there. Like there was this, we like created this set that was like created by artists using the commercial material in a way that may be considered subversive or maybe not. And there were a lot of artists who gave talks there. So this was my TEDx talk and the piece that I'm showing you comprises both the TEDx talk and some physical objects that I made. full screen here. Live and direct from Kunst Museum, Liechtenstein. It's TEDx Vaduz 2013. Radically open. Hi, so I'm Emily, and I'm a brand consultant, and I'm a part of K-Hole, which is a trend forecasting group that looks at advanced consumer behavior. And today, I'm talking about luxury branding. The reason I thought of doing that is because we're in Liechtenstein, and actually the company, one of the companies I work for branded Liechtenstein. I didn't have anything to do with it, but it made me think about what it meant to be a luxury brand, because of course, Liechtenstein, a big part of its identity is affluence. Another reason why I wanted to talk about luxury branding is money. It's a giant, giant market force. It's about 217 billion euros <laughs> last year in the luxury market. Google made $37.4 billion in revenue, and LVMH, the biggest luxury company, made 39.4. At the same time, talking about luxury is kind of like a bad taste thing to do. People don't really like to talk about it. It makes people feel pretty uncomfortable. 
And as a part of K-Hole in particular, one of the things we like to talk about is what makes us uncomfortable about consumption. So this is an image from our most recent report that talks about how the crisis of what it means to be special and different is everybody's crisis. And this really also applies to luxury brands in particular because they're all about being scarce, difficult to get, more authentic than other things. And at the same time, we are coming to realize that this may not necessarily be true. So we're living in an age where civilians can travel to outer space on Virgin Galactic, and Alexander Wang is available for sale for about $16 at Forever 21, the same day of the runway show. And you can rent a private island on Airbnb. This one costs $500 per night in case anybody's interested in going to Fiji. And so it's becoming very clear that mass luxury is no longer a new thing. It's sort of the current state of affairs, and it's been that way for a while. Yet there's this contradiction in terms, because how can you be luxury in the traditional sense and mass at the same time? This is from Rap Genius, which collects all of the different words and rap songs. And you can see that luxury and Nike, so luxury on one hand and it's sort of really major mass brand on the other, have been sort of reversing their poles on and on and are kind of trending toward being converging again. So in the spirit of that convergence, my argument is that the old model of luxury, which was based on the conspicuous consumption of rare and expensive goods, is being overtaken by an emergent form of luxury, which I'm calling information-based luxury. That's all about showing how much control you have over big systems of information. So what does that have to do with an old jacket? This is an MA-1 flight jacket. It's the original one from the 50s. It was produced by the American military in response to a real technological reality of new jets that flew much higher than the other ones, so it got much colder and were also much more cramped. So the big sort of Amelia Earhart leather jackets that they had got were not comfortable. So this is the MA-1. And what's interesting about the MA-1 to me is that it's basically a fashion meme. It's something that's been retooled in tons of different contexts, high and low, pretty much continuously since it was invented. So whether you're a skinhead with a bottle that you're about to break and over someone's head and slit their throat with, or you're a model in an avant-garde Japanese runway show, you can be wearing an MA-1, and it often looks very much like every other MA-1. So it's a formula that's available to everybody. And somewhat like TEDx, you can have an MA-1 whether and create, use all of its elements, whether or not you have any sort of special relationship to the origin of it, and every MA1 looks like every other MA1. So to me, it's a status symbol that's about not being special, and it's a status symbol that flaunts how not special it is because it automatically, in a formulaic way, references all the other MA1s that exist, and to me, that's an emergent form. So, this is the Buzz Rickson. This is a really interesting example of this new form of luxury. It's a Japanese replica of the original military MA1s from the 50s, but it costs about six or seven hundred dollars, and every single element of the original is sort of amped up in this hyper-specific way, becoming what the science fiction writer William Gibson called more authentic than its original, and he's written a lot about these jackets. So if you look at the seams on the side, they're crinkled, and that's because back in the day when they started making MA1s, they didn't have the machines to sew them straight. So of course the Japanese amp this up and make it even more crinkled than the original. So this reminds me of what the scholar Bruce Robbins calls the sweatshop sublime, which is an appropriate thing to talk about surrounded by the Alps. This feeling, this vertiginous feeling of being on the top of the mountain and feeling conscious of the entire system of things and also conscious of your little place in it, gets translated into the sweatshop sublime as this moment when you have a mass-produced garment or object, whatever it might be, and all of a sudden you have this super vertiginous moment where you're aware of all of the different people and labor practices and families and factories that went into making it, and then all of a sudden it zooms back in and you're just holding a thong in Forever 21. 
So this oscillation between something totally banal and specific and something totally overwhelming and giant is the sweatshop sublime. And to me, the sweatshop sublime is intimately related to new forms of luxury, in part because it's kind of evil and luxury has always been a lot about making us a little bit uncomfortable. Many hundreds of years ago, the word luxury actually just meant sexual intercourse. And it comes from the Latin root of a word that means to wrestle or strain or struggle. So there's something kind of fundamentally uncomfortable about the word luxury itself. Recently, there's been a new uncomfortable episode relating to the MA1. So that's Kanye West, in case you didn't know. And that's his Yeezus tour jacket. And on the sleeve is a Confederate patch. And this created an enormous, enormous amount of controversy, which makes sense because why would one of the most famous black superstars in the world be wearing a Confederate patch? To me, this MA1, specifically Kanye's, represents a great example of what the future of luxury will be. It's a completely casual, inconspicuous look in certain ways that at the same time is referencing major, major systems of information and power, and his ability to wear it so casually is what confers so much status on him in the first place. Basically what Kanye is doing is stretching the reality maintenance field, and that's what branding does. It tries to figure out what's happening in our field of vision and in our feelings and sort of create a story that stretches our reality to fit it in. And to me, luxury are the things that kind of push that and distort it. But like Alan Alda says in the Woody Allen movie, Crimes and Misdemeanors, it's funny if it bends, not funny if it breaks. So if you want to know more about normcore luxury, go to khole.net, and thank you so much. So that was my TED Talk. Sorry for making you watch the entire thing, although I haven't seen it in a while. It's kind of nice to watch it. The, um, so what I did with this talk was, so, so a lot of, oh, no, now we're going to have to watch. I don't even know what this is. We're going to have to like watch the next thing. <laughs> we're, it's like a big problem uploading porn, I've heard. Can we, should I just close it? Close it. Okay. So um, basically, like, I was soup, as I described in the talk, like, I was super into these, like, prefabbed forms that are, like, these systems of brands. So I started to notice while I was in Liechtenstein, one of these bags. And you may, like, you may have seen these around. It's a very Canal Street object. It's actually made by this Dutch company called Robin Ruth. And there are also knockoffs of these. But there are these, like, local bags where, like, in every place that you go, you can get, like, a Liechtenstein or a New York or, like, a Bora Bora like patterned typographic textile made into all of this merchandise. And so I've been really interested in the way that you can sort of operate within these templates, like TEDx is a template, and sort of create like promotional merchandise that's still like further, that kind of stretches the reality of those objects. So I got really into this Liechtenstein bag, which I didn't buy. And so instead of buying it, I made this like spin off of the talk in the shape of a jacket. So this is the pattern of it exploded. And basically, I took one particular MA1 jacket. I'm also wearing an MA1, which is like a kitschy thing to do, but like this is one of them. Um, and I basically created, I took a jacket and basically through like, instead, through like a kind of like pretty intensive process of like recreating this pattern, having it laser cut into a stencil and like hand spray painting it in many layers onto the lining of an MA1, made this like, kind of oversaturated like souvenir of my own talk using these kind of like forms that exist in a lot of different places. So this is like a regular military specification MA1 jacket you can buy on Amazon. And what it's holding here are like these souvenirs of different innovation and tech conferences that I went to. So this one is from the TEDx conference itself, but one of my favorites is from TED. And so it says young, wild, and free, I think, or like young, wild, and innovative. And it's actually a, um, my friend's mom borrowed one of like a Facebook execs tag to sneak me in to the tech conference. So these like, these lanyards in particular are a format that I'm really interested in because they become a sort of like currency. They're like, like teenagers piling up concert wristbands to show like this uh, in this like innovation conference economy where you give these types of talks that are supposed to circulate you also get these souvenirs of having been to them 
So I like the idea of like piling them up as an as an art object and like giving them even more like symbolic significance. Um, and then it was also because I think that it's what's weird about these sort of lanyards is that they both function on this sort of like prestigious level, but also if you're like a Foxconn worker, you wear one in the factory. So they kind of like operate through these different registers that I think are the sweatshop sublime. So like, yeah, basically this jacket was like this oversaturated souvenir from my talk that I gave that's on the internet. Um, I also made these 3D printed charms. So 3D printed, all, 3D printing also being this sort of form of mass customization that could create these like local souvenirs. So Vaduz is the name of the place. I found this on Etsy and had it made and loaded all the data from the conference onto it and made it one of the charms for the jacket. So um, that's it basically. Thanks for listening to me. Now we're all going to talk. Thank that's you, it. Emily. So it would be good to um, hear you say something about where you have shown the jacket. Sure. So I showed it as part of, so Simon Denny, who threw the TEDx conference, then had a show kind of like with all of the stuff that was, he kind of made a show about the TEDx conference at T293 in Naples. And this was part of the show there. Um, and so it was. This is a, another good example of like where is the art actually happening. I was like operating in a context that was made by another artist, which is something that I do a lot. It's like rare that I like make art proper, whatever that might mean. Like I don't have like a studio practice. I like don't have like moments of inspiration that then like lead to me making a thing that then I like convince somebody to show in a gallery and sell. It like has literally never happened to me and probably never will. Um, I pretty much always make art in contexts that are already like set out for me. So based on invitations? Based on invitations or like based on my own intervention into things that I'm already involved in. Um, so at this point, maybe I should say something that uh, I also mentioned yesterday, that uh, for uh, some people, the question, what does an artwork do, has appeared a little awkward. Um, and the more obvious question being, what is an artwork? But I think it's interesting to um, draw on the performative in the sense that the work which you have chosen is doing something for you, but also for others, and not to get stuck with the idea of, of definitions, and also not to uh, stay on the level of the, of the uh, generalized, but be very specific. So I'd like to think about this as us trying to get down to uh, building blocks or some fundamentals. And on that note, um, just like yesterday, I'm curious uh, what you would say as comments to each other. <laughs> you want to go first? Well, first is that our projects seem really similar. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, what I do think is really similar about them is this like obsession with anxiety and the point at which things become uncomfortable and the point at which things like create this loss in translation moment. Like that was the most, in, that was like the point of your work from what I saw here. Like what are these, what is it about our own discomfort and like what is the relationship between our own discomfort and interest in a topic and like what is it, is it good to take things really lightly or not? Which is something that I also struggle with a lot in terms of like my use of all these commercial Symbol. So that was, but what's different about your work, which I really admire, is that you're like dealing with live humans with really complicated histories, whereas like I had this inert jacket to wrestle with. So it's a different situation. Well, but there are live people in your audience. It's true. Who I couldn't, I was actually, one of the things I really wanted to know is are they in on the joke, if there is a joke, or? That is a really good question. Or, or maybe there isn't a joke. I mean, one of the things I was sitting there and thinking, I was really wondering what the TEDx audience whether they were, uh, they were, whether they were taking it in as something they were going to go and get, or from moment one they understood. Well, I think that particular audience was funny because, like, who goes to see like a TEDx conference in Liechtenstein is like already a fairly like niche crew. Um, so it was like a mix between like kind of like business people from Liechtenstein and art people from like Switzerland and Berlin who had like come to see the thing. And so they obviously were expecting a certain type of shtick from me and Simon, an artists that they knew like were interested in consumption. I think that like, 
I like to think I norm core, which is where the cable came up with that became this huge meme. Like bef before it became this huge meme, the way I like to think of it was like in kitsch, like the jokes on you and camp, the jokes on me and norm core, the jokes on everybody. Like I kind of, I, I don't want to, it's like a, people have gotten in my face legitimately about like it being a cop out to be like, we don't know if this is a joke or not. Or like, we don't know. It's all one thing. Like is it commercial? Is it art? But I think that like that like radical not knowing is where the artwork comes from. It's like, I really don't know. Maybe I like make this jacket to try and like process some of that so I can show myself if it like is or isn't commercial or is or isn't art or is or isn't evil. I think one thing I wanted to add just because yeah. I was looking at it and also still processing my own experience of talking and therefore listening to you and running that through in a in a imperfect feedback loop. I was thinking that your work, I presume, exists in a context of irony being a sort of a accepted entry point and people can choose to go through that or not, but it's their choice. Um, and I think when I encounter people like Peter, the person in my latest film, there's both generationally and in terms of what worlds he's in, there's a complete rejection mm -hmm. of irony. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he would find, uh, you know, he would encounter your work and think, he would take it as straight up the sort of capitalism that he battled. And then you would go to him and say, but that's not my project. And you'd explain. And I think there's a, there's a very big gap. Um, and it's not, doesn't mean that you or I necessarily have to speak to everybody, but I, but I always think about the audience and I always think about what languages we are so used to that it's automatic and then we get shocked when someone doesn't get it. So for me, yeah. it would actually be really interesting if somebody at the TEDx conference stood up and said, wait, but that's actually wrong. Or Well, people did come up to me after and say, like, oh, you love capitalism. Right. Like, you love capitalism. And, like, <laughs> and what did you answer? Or what did you say? Well, I don't like. I don't really remember. I think uh -huh. I was like, no, like I don't Wait, or whatever. But me. like, the or like you're not really getting. It's like more complicated than that. Like, which is like such an annoying answer. Like, it's more complicated than that. And so, Juice Martinez is a good friend of mine and of E Fluxes. Like, I was recounting this issue to her where I was like, academics in Europe always are coming up to me and being like, you love capitalism, and I'm like, no, I don't really like. It's complicated. And she was like, yeah, well, we, you know, we love capitalism, but not all day long. <laughs> And I, that's like been the best answer that I've gotten so far. Like not all day. <laughs> but I think what you're struggling with, like in thinking about, I love that when you were saying that like malice looked good on the screen, but like the longer, more hyphenated version didn't, and that becomes an issue. Um, I think that that actually, in a way, gets to like the root of the question of this talk. In a way, it's like what. Because to me, like, yes, there are like artistic gestures, but there are also like there's art in the sense of like wanting to make a decision surely because of its aesthetic beauty, which can be as simple as like wanting to see a nice set of six letters centered on a screen on a nice picture, mm -hmm. and like especially in the case of what you're describing, there are like, so many things attached to it that are way beyond like the symmetry of those letters on a screen, and you have to deal with your own desire as an artist to like square your like political or like more intellectual understanding of a larger situation with your desire for this good looking frame. And that's where I think like the question of the artist comes out in a really interesting way. What do you think about that name? I, think, I mean I'm 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 still struggling with the fact that I wish somebody like Peter was in this room because I think I think still I'm able to speak within my comfort zone. And that experience was, is a, you know, we, we take reality as our material. Um, you know, there may be some fiction, but it's broadly reality, whether in a satiric tone or in a fairly representational and yet struggling with the representation tone. But that reality we use and then we take away with us. And I feel that um, one of the things that I would really like to encounter is that reality actually banging against the work that I've made. And this film now has been a struggle precisely because that actually has happened. Right? I mean, he has actually asked to see, nicely, but he has asked to see the film. And with a understanding that he will give comments. 
and he has given comments, right? And it would turn out that he didn't want anything changed that much, but he wanted some things to be more precise. But you know, that's an unusual experience because I don't work in a documentary space, for example. And so the context is usually that you deal with reality, but you then leave. And you don't have to keep, or, or you, you know, it's the same thing I said about irony. It, oper it works because it operates in a space where there's an understanding and nobody breaks that understanding. But somebody could, right? I mean, just as somebody could, you know, go to one of the performative projects at wherever museum and say, actually, no, I'm going to break it in the middle. I'm not going to cooperate. But, uh, but that usually doesn't happen but somehow. I think my interest in these forms like, like TEDx or like the language of brand consulting and marketing is that like they actually operate more broadly than irony. It's more like in this room might see like a talk about innovation and think that must be ironic because it's so outlandish. Mm -hmm. And it's so like silly and ridiculous, or react or because the way, it's so capitalist. or because it's yeah. so capitalist, yeah. or it's just like cartoonish. But really, that's like a completely earnest gesture that a whole other set of people are seeing as like real Im crucial information being delivered to them. And that's like when Cahill got our hands on the first set of real corporate trend forecasting reports that inspired our original work. We were like, "This is insane! Like this PDF costs twenty thousand dollars, and it has emoticons in it. And like, are they fucking for real?" And like they were for real, and they were being taken deadly serious. And so it's funny to me to say, like, I was actually coming out of a situation when I gave this talk of like giving so many presentations in the context of brand consulting, where like people totally like punctured my jokes all the time. Like my stuff was constantly being cut down and remixed and turned into like actionable insights. And like I had to take out all the stuff that I thought was like cool and beautiful and funny in it. And I had to like kind of maintain my own private irony and my own mm. private jokes about it. But it like the context that I was in was taking it totally for fucking serious. And so being able to work as an artist in these same forms is sort of like getting to channel all these desires that I have from do it for doing the thing for real and doing it the way that I want. Um, so it like it's more complicated than that. But it's not like I've only ever done the ironic weird kind. It's like the this version of it comes out of like these pent up aesthetic desires that happen in the experience of having to do like the real version. Sorry for using the word real. <laughs> it's okay. And um, Naeem, you were mentioning that the, the film you're working on now is the third part of a kind of trilogy. And you've also indicated that um, the third one is rather different. But as it's not ready, it's still speculation in terms of wh what does this work actually do. But if we stay within that uh, realm, and if you can uh, embroider a bit more um, about the, let's say, tensions that it has created in relation to, to your other films, um, mm. what can you say then? Um, I think. Uh, the, I mean, one thing I already mentioned, of course, that he's engaged in a way others haven't been. Um, I think with the other two films, there's actually still a clear story in some ways. Um, the first one, there's a hijack that goes dreadfully wrong, but we're still comforted by thinking that in the end, the hijack ends, not peacefully, but it ends. Um, there's closure, they leave, they go off to Algeria, they become what I've called revolutionary orphans without a project, successful hijack, nothing else to do. You're Japanese, you don't speak Arabic, they're adrift. Um, the second one, because he's a case of mistaken identity, he comes away from that movement saying, you know, I enjoyed debating the finer po points of Marxism-Leninism, but I wasn't an activist, and in the end, that's why they let me go. He has this sort of remove position because he escaped that moment. Um, his story is particularly complicated because I think within that is an unspoken, um, unspoken within the film, but spoken between us in person. There were compromises made. Um, there were comrades that were left behind. Um, you know, I don't talk about it explicitly, but it's there uh, for the reading. That one of the reasons he made it out was because he was a European um, in the wrong place, wrong time, or he would say right place, right time. So that's why he was released. Nobody else was. So I think there's tremendous amounts of, and he says this, but it's not in the film for, because it, we talk about it really when the camera stops and we go out to lunch. Um, 
you know, he, he, he's living that moment um, as the reason it's not resolved is not just because of, um, you know, there's two ways to look at the revolutionary left moments of the 1970s and 60s. One is as resolved history, and then I'll look at it now, or it's ongoing, it has an impact on now, or it reflects on the failures of now, um, which have two different sort of languages. His is sort of a third one where that moment is so unresolved that bringing it up is bringing up these ghosts that require exorcism, which my film isn't doing. Mm. Um, so I think... In the uh, sense of not delivering release. It's not delivering release to him and not delivering release to me. Right? We talk about things in private, and then we say, oh, that should be in the film. And then we said, no, it shouldn't be, because here are all the other things that will open, and are we ready for that? Um, so it's a... I mean, structurally, it's, 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 it, you have to sit with him for a really long time. It was just him talking, interrupted by my question. But um, it sets other things in motion. And I suppose one of the things that for me is revealing is I'm really, uh, I think I've been in a universe of myself and other friends who we make, uh, we, I, I have a couple of friends who are all looking at these times, and partially to understand the now, this moment of so many fail movements also. But I think we've been making these works and still been able to not be haunted by it because there's a there's a closure somehow. And this one, there's no closure. Like he's, you know, he'll come and see the film at some point, and then he'll see who's watching it, and then that will be a problem for him depending on who it is. Um, so I, I, maybe that didn't answer your question, but it spoke to what my anxieties are right now about the film, or or this feeling of it's good when something isn't smooth. This is a very rough project. To me, this is very, I mean, this is like a hardcore comparison, but it's like, or I can speak from my own experience, like being a New York Jew, where like being Jewish is just like good and special, means you're like a little special, and like big, like a bagel with locks on it. And then you go to Germany and you meet like Holocaust survivors, and it's like a completely unresolved cultural situation, even for the Jews who are your age. And it's like a much more intense identity in all ways and it makes you reflect on the way that you've been able to like take your Jewishness so lightly and when I say you I mean me it's like I had this experience it's like um and you kind of step through the looking glass into like a continuum that you're on but like a p political or cultural situation that's like so unresolved and you realize how unhaunted you've been in your own like light processing of it so like I definitely can relate to that not necessarily in terms of these particular movements um but it is funny to think like what that guy would think seeing my thing. Hmm. Um, like, they're very far away from each other. Um, and I do feel kind of unhaunted by his struggle in a particular way. Um, and thinking about it in that way is kind of interesting. Like, it makes me wonder why I'm so unhaunted by it and kind of ask that question. But one thing that I'm, in, like, impressed by, like, hearing you talk about it is that, like, I can tell this guy kind of got to you or whatever. Like, you really care what he thinks. Hmm. Like, it really freaks you out that he might not like it or that like you really view, it's like when you're talking about it, you're like, he said I can't do this, so like I can't, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's like, well, he probably could, like what would happen? Like, be like rude or something? Like, I still think it's like cool that you don't, but it's mm -hmm. not like an actual rule and it just means that like you really fucking respect this person. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also interesting, I think, because you, you, um, wanted uh, initially to focus a bit more on Godard's film Here and Elsewhere, which is so much about distancing. Right. Um, and in fact, in, in this film, it's much more about proximity somehow. But, but in the Godard film, they've already made one version called exactly. Victory. And um, there is a parallel I can draw, actually. Um, of course, the attack on the Fedayeen that killed all the Palestinians didn't depend on Godard's film. Right? They didn't track down that film and track the faces, et cetera. But there must have been a part of him that says, well, while making this propaganda film, did we actually create this illusion that made it possible for this disaster to happen? Because one of the things people say about the Palestinian movement is that the expressions of international solidarity were fundamentally fragile. The people weren't there in the numbers that people thought there were. I mean, there's another story about Bangladeshis who supposedly fought in Lebanon alongside the PLO. And the big debate is whether they were a group of hundred or a group of thousands. And that's where the inflation comes and matters. Um, so you know, th there's a way that I feel that the film that he finally makes, that they finally make, comes out of also some sort of pretty clear guilt about the 
the image war that they participated in and whether people paid the price for that. Mm. Um, you know, and in the case of uh, Peter, one of the things that does haunt him, and he does talk about this on screen, is because he spoke English as well as Bengali, one of his tasks was to produce documents. That's how he could be useful. So he analyzed the movement, but that also meant he produced all these documents. And this he does talk about on camera, that producing so many documents was a mistake because when the crackdowns happened, those documents were the evidence. So his, a certain kind of, he wouldn't call it capitalism, but a certain kind of productivity, hyper-productivity in that moment led him in particular to, produce, to document the movement while it was going on. Um, and so that's one of his places of guilt also. Um, yeah. So maybe at this point we um, should open up if, for comments and questions and thoughts. There are a couple of microphones. I think there is one there. Can, can I, can I start because there I happen to have the microphone? The mic is raised so there. <laughs> Let's try and make them meet. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, really smart, um, both of you. I really am very different, and I really appreciate that difference, and I really appreciate the contradiction. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the, the attention to William Gibson. Um, I really think that he does a really smart job of analyzing brand culture and its impact in a really wide way, and I think it's really important to do that. Um, I guess my, my comment or my question would be about privilege um, and about who has the right, who claims the right to signify the universal. And when you talk about, I guess, Naeem's question about irony and a context for irony is about who, not just like who's in the joke and who gets it and who's involved in capitalism, but what position people occupy with relationship to capitalism and their access to humor and their access um, to the manipulation of brands. And I guess when Naeem is talking about guilt in the context of his narrative, I don't sense the same profound responsibility to guilt in your presentation. And I'm not <laughs> sure that you, I mean, you know, I'm a white girl from New York, um, but uh, that I think is the, that's, that's the context, if I understand correctly, that Naeem is pointing to, that there's a, there is a joke. There is a. There are people that don't get it. They are outside of irony, um, in a really deep and profound way. Um, and th I think there's that acknowledgement um, exists in the science fiction. It exists in the literature, um, and it doesn't exist in the corporate discussion about branding. And uh, I think it should. I think it would deepen even the humor of your position. Um, Do you want to comment on that, Emily? Um, sure. I guess, like, the way that I, I mean, I can't comment on, like, whether or not I, like, show a profound enough sense of guilt for my position. But, like, I actually think that, for the most part, like, being, like, a girl in marketing is not actually, like, a very, like, strong position to, like, critique global capitalism or to like create any sort of like big political or even aesthetic change like ordinarily like you're making powerpoints um, to like as a sort of like smoke and mirrors dance for corporate executives who aren't going to listen to you at the best like if you're doing the best thing and even being a trend forecaster like even being able to articulate things about culture or make jokes about it or even be aware of like fashion doesn't actually mean that you have any power um, and I don't necessarily know if you get more power from like talking about it in a m more like <coughs> expanded way, but I think that maybe you could. So like I don't necessarily think that like I'm speaking from <laughs> such like a. I mean I'm not like trying to say that I'm not privileged in a lot of ways. But I'm not. I don't think that I'm speaking from this this position of like high exalted power. If anything like. Working in the marketing world, I more like marveled at how like the artists that I knew thought that like all the marketers around were making all the decisions. It's like marketers aren't making the decisions. Like marketers are in Congress. K hole is in Congress. Like we're not responsible for wealth inequality. Like we're not that rich. We're not making any money. So it's like it's a complicated thing. I'm gonna end with the it's a complicated answer. Yeah. 
I keep thinking. I I I, I keep thinking, or I keep wondering what was what your your interest name was in in Godard's because this was I mean as I it's been a long time since I've seen the film but as I remember it was really something that was it was it was so much about the contradictions that were built into built into the movements that you could read back through through images and and through the use of of language right so in a way it almost it's almost like it becomes distracting to to think in terms of of irony, or in terms of responsibility. Even actually, what we are talking about in a way, or how to kind of contain or 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 or, or account for, mm -hmm. for 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 wild contradictions that can't be that can't be reconciled. I mean, this is why. I mean, th 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 with this, I also kept thinking of, I kept thinking of what the now famous K holes K holes mass Indian norm core dialectics, <laughs> which are I mean. Which are a really interesting kind of flip of even kind of like Godard's, like kind of you know pseudo pseudo depressive look at look at at Fatah and 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 PLO and and where there is this kind of the, the really kind of like strange sort of alien and and kind of like like a very sexy flip that that this norm core kind of thing does is that what does it say that actually this there is some kind of a bloat in in what what is mass indie or maybe 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 Emily can can describe it better like what what is mass indie it's like actually like a bloat or reaching a limit in what can in how many ways you can slice <laughs> forms of expressing individuality right yeah. like you reach a limit and you can't it's a and it's a problem of the image where you can't create distinctions anymore you you can't you, you can no longer create distinctions. You've run out of forms. Well, you can't you can no longer create distinctions, and then your desire to try and like not make distinctions creates another distinction. So yeah. You're like trapped. This is the like all hipsters think they look different, but they're actually the same. And the more different you look, the more of a hipster you look. And so. it and it grows a kind of like a protocol of of a protocol of of communality, which is which is superficial. Um, but it is a protocol nonetheless. It's a it's a it's it's a rule system, right? This is a, this was very. I, I kept thinking of these two things next to each other. I mean, the thing about um, that project, I I don't know if anyone has seen it. I've never been able to track down the original film, Victory. Um, and as I understand it, Goda actually got involved really later. Um, um, uh, leaving aside for a second the question of the language and all of that, how that film was made. I was also interested in this other thing that happens in that moment, which is the moving forward and then looking back. And there are various ways we see that gesture. Sometimes people come to a historic event for the first time many years later. And so all that has happened in the intervening years is the layer through which you're looking back. In this case, they're looking back, but they're also looking back at how they saw that moment. Um, and yet, they've also taken that footage out now and layered in a whole new soundtrack, new set of text. So you don't know how they looked at it. Right? And I have personally, uh, that's one of the things I am personally invested in, which is the various forms of looking back. Um, one is a fairly clear and easy one to us, which is we're now, we're going to look back, we're going to parse, we'll, the mistakes will become more clear to us, et cetera. Um, another is the fact that we're looking back from a moment. Um, so this is, uh, Stuart Hall made this argument in, at the height of Thatcherism, that he said the left's failure is that they don't apprehend the moment they're in now. And his argument might have been a fairly straightforward solution-based argument, that this is, you're, you're still applying the old tactics. That's one way to look at it. Um, I'm looking at that statement, and I'm thinking, oh, but Stuart Hall said this during Thatcher. Oh, Thatcher, that's already 30 years ago. And I'm trying to now use a 30-year-old quote printed somewhere else where I read it to think back to 40 years. Um, and somewhere in this middle of this is this Goda film um, and this sort of work of somehow in that case, I don't know if it was a French situation or Goda in particular, or Ziga Vertov group, they were able to get to a level of distance very rapidly, much more rapidly than other. In, in some ways, the disenchantment happened much faster. Um, so these are things I'm interested in working through because, of course, there's something happening now when I'm looking back. Then I'm looking back with Peter. 
then I'm looking back with him first in 2012, then 2013, 2014, his position has changed. Then he looks at the film and then he says, you know, oh, there's one thing I've left out and then he says something much more. So this whole cycle walking through time, um, at least for me and I think a lot of us is crucial and I think connecting, for example, to your work, you know, I think that work would operate differently if it came out in 2008, for example. Mm -hmm at the height of a particular kind of crisis, when suddenly perhaps even you might have felt, we might have felt, oh, this is actually the moment to not use irony, but to strike at the beast. And now in 2014, 15, we might say, okay, no, it's prevailing anyway. So now back to other devices. So time is always in this. Mm -hmm. And two, three years from now, you'll look back at this and have a completely different way of looking. And in some ways, um, the revolutionary left in the 60s and 70s is a very stark example because there's so much possibility that they're working through, and that seems so alien. Mm. It seems from mm -hmm. another planet to try to imagine that. Um, so, Well, talking about time and, and, and this travel that you're describing, um, what, is there a sense in the new film um, which moves clearly, perhaps addresses the future? Um, not the future, but he talks about the Netherlands of the present and talks about the irony that uh, the country that he belongs to formally and that rescued him in that time is now sort of, he considers it sort of a island of neoliberal stability. So there's disappointment with his present. Um, he doesn't talk about the future. No. Um, and I think my journey with these projects haven't been so much to project a future yet. I don't think that... I don't think I've, I think most of us haven't finished comprehending the time we're in now in order to project a future. Well, Cable's whole project in a lot of ways is like using the lie that we're talking about the future to talk about the present. So like we just tell everyone that we're talking about the future to like gain license to scenarios in which we can actually talk about emergent behavior and try to reflect on the present. And in a funny way that you're talking about like going through these different time lenses, it's like even for our own reflective or reflexive practice, like it becomes much easier for us to talk about the present, present when we're talking about it as if we're talking about the future. So like, when we, when, if you just say to someone or say to ourselves, like, talk about the present moment that you're in perfectly, it's like really difficult to actually have that moment, which is something that you're also talking about. But if you say like, okay, well, we're going to try to predict the future right now. We're going to try to like figure out what we think is going to be happening in like five years or 10 years. So what do we see happening now that we want to make a bet on? And that's a way for you to like retroactively find the present. So I see these like different time, like as mental models, like we use like the past or the future as like devices to be able to reflect on the present. So it's like you can reflect on your own political question of like what, what, who am I now like in relationship to these different de political desires by like looking at this time where it seems like there's this a crazy unbridled sense of possibility or like whatever or I might say you know like that's the. I, I, I think it's interesting that that you're uh, focusing so much on, on forecasting and speculation about the future uh, thinking about the historical turn and, and the nostalgia for almost anything historical which somebody like Boris Budin has has uh, described as retrotopia, uh, a condition uh, that he has looked at particularly in relation to Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the inability to uh, talk about, to think about the future without dressing it up so that it looks like the past. A repeat of the past. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. So it's, it's um, uh, a mimicry uh, somehow of the past um, and that he uh, sees as a big, big problem. And to me, it seems as if you're cracking something open there. Well, I mean, in a more like practical way, I mean, when you say retrotopia, like I actually just think of Retromania, the book by Simon Reynolds, a music critic. Like, in a lot of ways, the place where Cable came from was a more pop cultural position about obsession with things being retro. Like, when we were starting to talk about these things in 2009, 2010, it was like things were super like pamphlety and print obsessed in the art world. I was making these little zines about the past. There was a lot of like cabinet magazine, like ye old time machine, like steampunk, like Brooklyn, whatever. Like let's make a magazine again because maybe we can't make magazines and like let's make it about the past. 
And so part of it was just like straight up old school punk oppositional logic where we were like, well, everyone's doing this old timey shit. Let's talk about the future and let's not print a magazine and like it'll be cheaper that way anyway. Like a lot of it came from these sort of like practical oppositional places that then we like over the last five, year, five years have like embroidered into a theoretical position. But I think that the, the gestures that they came from were more similar to a band being like, how do we make music that sounds like different than the music that people are making right now and what annoys us about what's happening. It's like, in a way, but I guess this is also a retro topic, but it's like what mods were like, where they're like, oh, we're just going to be really slick or something. Um, so now I'm like back in the trap, I guess. Well, time is, is running. Um, do we have, yeah, here is one. Hello. Hi. Um, one of the things that struck me, so in your description of the sweat, Sweatshop Sublime, you talked about how the appeal of it is that it uh, suggests that you have a certain kind of um, aerial perspective on mass systems and like an ability to perceive complex nets of information um, so that there's a certain kind of power that's leveraged from that access to information. And one of the things that was interesting to me about the progression of works that Naeem showed was that there's um, a increase in accountability from film to film, and there's also a decrease in the, um, uh, a corresponding inverse decrease or in inverse relationship with the uh, flexibility that you have in shaping yeah. that narrative, mm. right? A little decrease in the amount of power you have over that story. And so my question is about the relationship between power and accountability, and to what extent, um, because in one sense, the artist obviously has more power, the less accountable they are. And I'm interested in forms of power that would come from ex extreme accountability. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Kanye's use of the Confederate patch. Obviously, what happens there is that he's being held accountable to a particular narrative um, that perhaps he, uh, I don't know. So, well, I guess just one, like this whole point of the sweatshop sublime is that you're completely powerless. So I don't want to make it seem like it gives you any power. It's actually more trying to talk about this type of like the extreme experience of powerless that comes from like having these momentary flashes of what seems like an exalted or expanded sense of knowledge, but only gives you a more intense sense of your own powerlessness within the system. So you can say the same about also being like a marketer who thinks that they can make a fucking difference. It's like you might learn more about how like commercial tactics work, but that makes you like all the more powerless to change change them. So like it is interesting to think about this like this flexibility or accountability thing, but I don't I just want to make clear that like the point of the sweatshop sublime is not like, oh, you see the light and then can change stuff. It's more like you see the light and now can more painfully still not change anything. That's the point of it. Um, but I think that's interesting in the way that you framed Naeem's pro progression of the three. Or maybe you could clarify like yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Foxconn worker. So is there a point at which when we look at an iPhone, we think, do you know what I, do you see I mean that there's an ethical relationship in this? I mean, well, you, you want you're, one, right? You're, you're like, criticizing you the one. one. Yeah. You want you're one. You're criticizing the lack of one. No, no, you want one. Like, that's good, right? Like, I don't think, you can't get it from anywhere else. Like, no, no like, I don't think that the artwork is going to give you an ethical relationship. I don't think, I think it's more like, What's annoying and what's unreleased about this type of exploration is everyone's like, well, where's the ethical responsibility? Like, there isn't one. You want one. Like, you have to make it for yourself. And I don't know how to make it. Like, I want one too. Like, I don't have one. Like, I try and find it. I try and find a way to like make something meaningful. Like, Naeem is getting really up close to shit that's meaningful and it's still frustrating. Like, the artwork isn't going to give you one. Like, Talking about a jacket isn't going to give you one, but it might make you want one more. <laughs> the funny thing, the funny thing you're talking about. It's, you know, I mean, it's very funny to, it's very funny to also think of desire as being completely in the realm of ca of, of capitalism, right? When actually, it was, when actually, if you look back at the sixties and the seventies, actually, desire was the main engine, uh, was was a main political engine, actually, not an ethical, like not not a sort of like. An ethical rectitude, what was actually driving was much more, was much more passionate, which is why it was so full of contradictions, don't you think? Right. So it's very funny that that desire is somehow, it's almost like a kind of, a, a kind of a Protestant division of, like di like a division of, uh, of forces. No, this is when is actually, it or like what I'm saying is that maybe like that same desire is being, reawoken, but like you're looking for the object of it in the wrong place. It's like. 
it's like you might actually, by dealing with these things or by seeing the TED Talk or dealing with it or, or seeing me talk about things in a particular way, be like, no, there should be a thing. But it's like you're not going to get it from my TED Talk. Like you might get the f desire for it, but you're not going to get the place to fix it. Like that's, I guess, where I see. Maybe that's the separation you're talking about. Yeah. You know, like a separation of powers. But I w one thing I kept thinking of, because St. Naomi were mentioning Godard's or his, his chronicling of, of disenchantment, but I kept thinking of enchantment when you were saying, like, like we, were, we, were always, we were always talking about disenchantment, but then, but then where are, where are like the forces of, of, of I don't want to say re-enchantment, like we want some kind of restoration of a lost, of like a lost enchantment, but where are the, where, but what is actually, you know, what is enchanting? What is shiny and promising? Well, this reminds like the last K hole meeting we had. Like we're like working on our next report. It's been a really long time. We're all feeling really anxious about that, and it's like all the stuff that we used to do to come up with something. We're like list. Like we're like all these like consumption experiences are like totally like dystopian or boring. And Greg, Kehol Greg, is like, there's no magic or whatever. There's like no sense of this enchantment, not just in our consumption, but also even in our political desires. So the next report is about magic, trying to explore these questions. Like, because I think that you do come to this question, like, in, from both directions, like, both from like a failed left and from like a failed like innovation conference. It's like both of these things, like, maybe there was magic off stage somewhere, but like, there doesn't seem to be magic now. Yeah, of course. The mic is on its way. Oh, Mary was first. Then. There's a red light. And, uh, and there is another microphone. Can I just project? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, so I think uh, one thing that is striking me as a, uh, a comparative uh, <laughs> relation to, to um, Emily's seeming uh, position in this moment, as, and you're describing uh, what you do and how you do it, uh, is I'm thinking about, I think it's um, a 10th century writer in Japan, uh, Sai Shonigan's Pillow Book. And I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm seeing, you know, sort of her contemporary iteration in this moment, um, because I don't know if other people are familiar with that book, but there's a sense of the way that she, she's, you know, she's embedded in the court, um, and she is subject to the court, but she is still with them, and she has this harsh slicing wit, you know, as she describes the details and she describes um, sort of uh, objects, jackets, sleeves. Like with precision, and and so there's this funny way that that that, that ends up. I end up feeling this as this this texture, um, and that yeah. And I say texture again because it, it seems like there's this like your tongue is slashing back and forth, fending off any sort of landing. And so what we end up is is with surface. And um, and and I guess I would also say you know I, I evoke this this female writer but I also think that happens because you also evoke the female when you say hey I was a young girl in the market I'm, I'm a powerless young girl and so you deploy gender but I, I I guess I would I I trust that as a deployment and and I don't see the works as gendered separately but then when both of you are together gender really starts happening so yeah Any comments? <laughs> but then, yeah. I well, it was meant to respond to what was happening before. But I was just going to respond to your response to Naim's being um, attached to the response of his subject. Mm. And just claiming to say that there are certain things that you cannot get. You know, there are certain things that you build and that you are. And that kind of you know, um, desire to gra grasp onto something that is so valuable to him is th that space that capitalism can never uh, uh, co-opt. Uh, so in that sense, that's, it's not about getting something. It's not like you get an ethical position. It's something that you build and you construct. It's something that you intrins intrinsically live. And that's the part that I think is what keeps us alive, you know? Uh, cynical positions and these kind of sar sarcastic um, uh, reasonings around um, whatever other things you have been talking about, just make me a little bit uneasy. 
because I want to grasp onto that situation of seeing somebody and wanting to respect that position, wanting to grasp, grasp onto that one thing that keeps us human. I think Natasha. No, no I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well. That seems I think like a good moment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a good moment to wrap up. Well, um, to be continued in the sense that um, other um, artists primarily have been asked to respond to the same question, what does an artwork do, but in written form uh, in the EFLUX conversations, and that will kick off uh, quite soon. Uh, where this will take us, we'll see. Um, I'm uh, quite... Um, determined to pursue it for a while to see at least uh, for myself what happens when we try and mix this in the discussions that we're having about all the other big questions that float around all the time. So thank you very much for coming and thanks again to EFLUX. Thank you.